Good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to go ahead and talk to you about your first experiment in General Chemistry 11141. Over the next few slides, I'm going to walk you through the worksheet that you need to print up and bring to your first lab meeting. What you see here is the first page for the worksheet that you'll be doing in your first lab. This is available on tracks. Under the resources tab, this is the first experiment. Um, it's an eight page PDF. Go ahead and bring, go ahead and print up a copy and bring that to lab with you. Um, what this first experiment is, is simply an investigation into the physical property of density. Um, in addition to that, we are investigating how to properly make measurements. We're going to look at a couple of different things and looking at significant digits and measurements. So what I'd first like to do is draw your attention to this figure right here. What this shows is a ruler and it shows you how to properly make a measurement. So when you look at a ruler, and you might have to zoom in on this, what you'll see is we can see clear definition of 7.6 and 7.7 .7 centimeters. However, this piece of paper that's being measured right here falls midway between 7.6 and 7.7. .7. Now, this is a good representation of significant digits or significant figures, as you might call them, sig figs, and making a measurement. Now, whenever you are making a measurement and recording data, what you want to do is record as many numbers as you possibly can with a high level of certainty. So if you see a ruler that shows you 7.6 and 7.7 .7 centimeters, and what you are measuring falls between them, you can make an approximation as to the actual length of that object. For instance, this piece of paper falls between 7.6 and 7.7. .7. Therefore, you can reasonably say 7.65 centimeters. Now, this is significant, and this gives you three digits to work with, three sig figs. What you cannot do, and what would be kind of reckless and inappropriate to do, is say that this piece of paper is 7.650 centimeters. Well, the reason for that is, how do you know? Where did the zero come from? Well, truth be told, you would just be guessing. and You have no reason to believe that it's 7.650 centimeters. So the measurement that you make is limited to three significant figures. It does not extend to a fourth significant figure. So that's what happens whenever you're using a ruler to make a measurement. You have a limited number of significant figures, and you have to keep that in mind whenever you're making an approximation as to the the length of that object that you're measuring with a ruler. Just like a ruler, you have basically the same rules with a graduated cylinder. Now, what's unique about a graduated cylinder and making a measurement with a liquid is you have to look for something called a meniscus. Well, you'll commonly see that as, as kind of like the curvature within a graduated cylinder. What you want to do is you want to identify the bottom of that meniscus. Bottom of meniscus. Now, whenever you see the bottom of that meniscus, that's where you are going to be basically identifying the, the volume of your solution. Now, the same thing applies when you're measuring with a graduated cylinder as whenever you're measuring with a ruler. If you can see two measurements, let's say this is 61 and 60 centimeters. If this line right here falls halfway between 61 and 60 centimeters, you can reasonably predict that the measurement of this liquid is 60, I'm sorry, not centimeters, milliliters, because we're talking about a volume. If you want to say this is 60.5 milliliters, that's a reasonable thing, that's a reasonable conclusion to draw. You cannot, however, say that this is 60.50 milliliters, because where did this figure come from? Where did this number come from? You don't have any pieces of data that let you make that approximation. We can make this approximation with our first number beyond the decimal place because of the fact that we have whole numbers of 61 and 60 milliliters of our solution. So we can reasonably kind of eyeball and make an estimation as to what that volume is 
between these two numbers. Okay. Now, one piece of, uh, or one common piece of laboratory equipment that you will use throughout the lab this semester is the digital balance. Now, a digital balance is nice because of the fact that it doesn't cause you to make any sort of uh, predictions or estimations. The digital balances that we use will give us 0, 0.00 grams. So this will give us two numbers beyond the decimal place. Two numbers beyond decimal. Now, there's a, uh, a common treatment where you'd want to put something onto this digital balance, and if it gives you a measurement of, of 9.22 grams, you'd want to say, oh, well, this is 9.220 grams. Well, the display on the digital balance gave you 9.22 grams. There is no reason for you to kind of make a prediction that it's precisely 0 0.220 or 9.220 grams. And you have no evidence to support this number. So you do not need to include it. Basically, in a simple way of putting it, the digital balance is not lying to you. If it tells you 10.64 grams, whatever that digital balance is, it means 10.64 grams. There's no need for you to look at this and say, oh, well, it's got to be 0 0.640. Instead, the number that the digital balance tells you is the accurate number. Now, one thing that you need to consider is you need to be able to use the tear function or the zero function on a digital balance. What you'll commonly see that as is a button that has something that looks like this, either a triangle, zero, and another triangle, or you'll see it as um, a triangle, and then, or I'm sorry, a circle with a triangle, letter T, and a close, another triangle. So whenever you see that, and whenever you press that button, whatever is on the scale, um, whether you have a way boat or no way boat on there, you will basically reset the reading on that scale to be zero. So what that allows you to do is it allows you to put a piece of glassware onto the digital balance, zero it out, and then add a substance to that digital balance so that you can figure out the exact mass of the substance that you're measuring within that piece of plasticware. The fourth page in your worksheet here has maybe one of the more important sections for practice problems in general chemistry one and um, beyond. And this is using those significant figures and utilizing them in calculations. So this very succinctly sums up a couple of rules. So significant digits when you're doing addition and subtraction and significant digits when you're doing multiplication and division. There are different rules. So this provides you a couple of examples. In addition to that, it provides you with, whenever you're presented with a number, um, which, which numbers are significant. Okay, so these rules right here are going to be your rules for whenever you're presented with a number, de determining which numbers are significant. Down here, as I draw another star, you'll be able to look at whenever you're doing a math problem, what numbers do you need to make sure that you keep in mind? Okay, so we're given a couple of examples. If you subtract 12.46 and 12.31, what is your answer going to be? What you need to do is round your number to the lowest number of significant digits, or sorry, number of decimal places, then do that subtraction. So each of these numbers right here come with four significant figures. When you do the math, you end up with your product only having two significant figures. So as another example, we have a multiplication and division problem. When you're doing multiplication and division, you need to count the number of significant digits in all of the numbers you're multiplying and dividing. Determine the smallest number of significant digits. Now, this doesn't say anything specifically about decimal places, 
it is more involved with the smallest number of significant digits. Round your answer to that smallest number of significant digits. Okay, so if we look at this first example, 12.46 times 12.30, our answer comes out to be 153.258. How many significant digits is that number? That's six. Well, each of our answers only had precision to four sig figs. So our answer, despite the calculator telling us that it had six significant figures, well, that's incorrect. We are limited to four sig figs. So our answer has to be, well, that number rounded down. So 153.258, we'll round that down to 153.3. This number has four sig figs, therefore that's our correct answer. There are a couple of other examples in this, and this worksheet as a whole is very useful for getting a good grasp of significant digits and calculations. Now, this page right here, the fifth page in the worksheet, I believe it's the fifth page, this has what you are actually doing. This tells you a little bit about your procedure and what you need to do. So make sure that you follow this procedure and record all of your data in the following tables. If you look on data table number two, this tells you all of the different things that you need to record and it asks you to look at a couple of different statistics. So basically what you will do is walk through the procedure understand all of the different measurements that you have to take record all of those measurements in this table and you should do just fine making it making your way through this experiment thank you very much and if you watch the next little bit of this video this will show you how to actually make the measurements take the measurements and everything like that thank you bye For your first trial in experiment number one, the first thing that you want to do is get your 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. Take that to the weigh room and determine the precise mass of this piece of plastic cord. Record that mass on data table number two. The next thing that you want to do after you've determined the mass of your 10 mil graduated cylinder is you want to want to take your 250 milliliter plastic beaker and collect approximately 200 milliliters of deionized water. The deionized water is this white faucet. DI stands for deionized. We only need about 200 milliliters of water. This is not an extremely precise measurement that you have to take. Howdy, I'm Dr. Gray. I wanted to talk to you about the first lab that you will be doing in General Chemistry 11141. That lab is a lab in which you're going to investigate the density of water. I'm going to talk more about that after a little while, but first of all, I wanted to show you your bin and the contents of your bin. What you'll always notice on your bin is a pair of stickers, and these stickers should say basically the exact same thing. This one says 1141001. This says the same thing. This number corresponds to your station in the lab. This means you are at station number one. Okay. Now, the contents of your bin, this bin will change from week to week based on what experiment you are, you are uh, conducting. So the first week, you will notice that you have two graduated cylinders. One graduated cylinder is a 10 mil graduated cylinder, and the other is a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. You will notice that you also have a ruler. You will also notice that you have a thermometer that goes to 110 degrees Celsius. It's always important to see the actual line where you can read the temperature of a solution or read the temperature of your, uh, uh, your specific sample. Um, in the event that you cannot read it, it's entirely possible that this item has been cracked or that this thermometer has been cracked. In the event that it is cracked, you'll want to take this to the stock room immediately so that you can avoid any sort of charge being penalized to you. The final thing in this bin is a 250 milliliter beaker. So you have only five things in your bin. You have a 250 milliliter plastic beaker, a 110 degree uh, thermometer, a ruler, two graduated cylinders, a 10 mil and 100 mil graduated cylinder. So that's all that there is to the uh, materials for this lab. Once you have your 200 milliliter beaker, or your 250 milliliter beaker with 200 milliliters of water, what you want to do is collect your 10 milliliter graduated cylinder that you've already recorded the mass on, 
and transfer more than one but less than five milliliters of water into this 10 mil graduated cylinder. Once you've transferred the appropriate amount of water, more than one but less than five milliliters of water, you will want to take your 110 degree graduate, your 110 degree thermometer and place it in the water. Let that incubate for just a few moments, should be no more than one minute, and you'll watch as the temperature changes and record the final temperature. Mine records 21.1 degrees Celsius. Once you've recorded that temperature, the temperature of your water on your data table number two, what you want to do is record the volume of water in your 10 mil graduated cylinder. My volume of water is 4.2 milliliters. After you've recorded your temperature, the mass of your empty graduated cylinder, you've added the water to your graduated cylinder, you've recorded the volume of that water, now what we can do is take this again to record or determine the mass of the water plus the graduated cylinder. Now that we've recorded the mass of water plus our graduated cylinder, and we previously have the mass of just our graduated cylinder, we can deduce what the mass of water in this sample is. When we have the mass and volume of water, we can then determine the density of water in this graduated cylinder. After you've collected all of your data for trial number one, you can complete the data table for trial number one. Now, what you need to do is go through steps six through eight and repeat basically the same process, determining the mass of your empty graduated cylinder, adding water of specified volumes in steps six through eight, to your 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, determine the volume of water that you added, the temperature of that water, and therefore, the, and that enables you to determine the density of water in that sample. So you will do a total of three trials with your 100 mil graduated cylinder. These trials are basically the exact same as what you did for your previous step with the 10 mil graduated cylinder. This first week's lab is fairly simple when it comes to cleanup. There are basically four pieces of glassware that came in contact with water. Our 110 degree thermometer, our 250 milliliter beaker, we have excess water, we can simply pour that down the drain. Our 10 mil graduated cylinder, if there's any water in there, empty it out into the drain. And our 100 mil graduated cylinder, again, any additional water, empty it down into the drain. Anytime we use any piece of glassware, what we always want to do is triple rinse it with deionized water. So I'm just going to take my 100 mil graduated cylinder, fill it up part way, empty it out. Fill it up part way, empty it out. Okay, so there's three rinses. Same thing with the 10 mil. Done. 250 mil beaker. Two, three. 110 degree thermometer, just run that under the water a couple of times, and now we're all done with the actual rinsing portion. Now once we've rinsed off our glassware, what we want to be sure that we do is we want to be sure to dry all of our glassware completely. The 110 degree thermometer, fairly simple. We can, after we've dried it off, we can put it in our bin. Our 250 mil beaker, dry it off, make sure that there are no droplets of water. We can put that in our bin. The 100 milliliter and 10 milliliter graduated cylinders are a little bit trickier. What you want to do is you want to take a paper towel and basically twist it up. Once you have that twisted up, what you are able to do is thread it into the graduated cylinder, simply turn that around. That will pick up most of the water that's on the exterior, or on the interior, I'm sorry. 
Anything on the exterior, well, you just want to wipe that off. Uh, do a visual inspection, no water's in there, we can return this to our pit. Same thing for our 100 milliliter graduated cylinder. Take our, one, our paper towels, twist those around inside the 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, wipe off the base. It's nice and dry and ready to go and we can put it back in our bed. There is no need to ever put anything like a thermometer or a pencil or a pen into a 100 or a 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. Simply use a paper towel, twist it up like I presented, and you'll be able to get that piece of glassware dry enough. And that concludes rinsing and cleaning the glassware for this week. Thanks!